It is therefore my pleasure to welcome now as our first speaker, Eric Grün. Eric is a phenomenon. He received his PhD from Harvard University in 1964. He teaches ancient history at the University of California, Berkeley since 1966, where he serves today as Wood Professor Emeritus. Eric is a world-renowned historian of the ancient world who contributed in his long and distinguished career many classic studies on the Roman Republic, the Hellenistic world and their cultures. And this is what I'm meaning, he's a phenomenon. That's already um, accomplishments for at least three scholars. Um, one of these classic studies is the last generation of the Roman Republic. A particular passion of Eric is the study of ancient Judaism, so that's yet another field um, and another lifetime achievement. Um, so to the study of ancient Judaism, Eric contributed two books, Heritage and Hellenism, The Reinvention of Jewish Tradition, and Diaspora, Jews amidst Greeks and Romans. Reading you his long list of honors, awards, fellowships, and visiting professorships would probably steal away most of the time for Eric's talk. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Eric, who will speak to you today about modern debates on ancient anti-Semitism. Thank you so much, Eric Green. Can I be heard? Thank you very much, Armin. Uh, you know, when one prepares to speak before a distinguished assemblage, there's always a great deal of nervousness and a lot of preparation in advance and anxieties about whether uh, you will succeed at all. But the one thing that makes it worthwhile is to hear the introduction. <laughs> now, I don't think I've ever been called a phenomenon before, but I noticed that uh, Armin coupled the phenomenon with the date of my PhD, so that I think he's suggesting here that the, what's phenomenal about it is that I'm still alive at this point to address you. But I am delighted to be here and... and uh, Most certainly that was not. I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, I'm very grateful to Armin and to the other organizers for inviting me to address this group. So we are already uh, over time, so I'll be, I, I will drop any further uh, preliminaries. As Jean-Paul Sartre famously remarked, if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. And he proceeds to assert that it is not the Jewish character that provokes anti-Semitism, but rather the anti-Semite who creates the Jew. Now those lines were penned after the liberation of France in 1944 and elaborated upon in 1946 following the end of the war when the dark shadow of the Holocaust hung heavily over Europe. Now for Sartre, the image of the Jew, or at least the negative image of the Jew, was pure construct, a means whereby anti-Semites could transform the Jew as victim into the Jew as culprit. Now the question of how far Jews themselves, through their practices, their activities, or their ideology, how far they themselves were responsible for the hostility that was leveled against them had long been a matter of debate among intellectuals who wrote about the Jewish experience in antiquity. Now, among the most strident accusations came from Voltaire. Jews, he said, have the effrontery to display an irreconcilable hatred against other nations, ever superstitious, ever envious of others' good, ever barbarous, abject in misfortunes, and insolent in prosperity. They detested all nations, and they were detested by them. 
That was the view of Jews by Greek and Romans, by Greeks and Romans, according to Voltaire, a view that Voltaire himself obviously shared. But when serious historians of antiquity began to write about Jews in the 19th century, the portraits became more nuanced, but also more diverse in approach, more complex, more splintered, more divisive. Contentious issues arose. Should ancient Judaism's relationship to pagan society be understood in religious or in political terms? Did the origins of anti-Semitism lie in hostility to the outsider or in clashes between ideologies? Did Jewish separatism generate alienation or did Jewish proselytism present a threat to uniformity? Were Jews a special target in themselves or were they simply one among the barbarous people whom Greeks and Romans regarded as inferior? Now for the eminent historian of Hellenism, Johann Gustav Droysen, Jews represented a, vi a vital part of his vision of the evolution of religious thinking that culminated in Christianity. A student of Hegel, Droysen composed his major studies in the mid 19th century on the transformation of the Eastern world through the coming of Alexander the Great and his successors and the spread of Hellenismus into the Orient. The Verschmelzung of East and West included the Jews, although not solely, not even primarily, but their religious principles, especially monotheism and devotion to precepts that they felt derived from divinity, this represented a notable contrast with Hellenic teachings and ideologies. And for the devout Christian, Droysen, the encounter between Hellenism and Judaism produced a kind of Hegelian synthesis that culminated in Christianity. In Droysen's concept, therefore, the significance of the Jews in pagan society stood on a more theoretical rather than a concrete plane. It was the religious element that they brought to Hellenism or to Hellenistic culture that fostered the combination that eventually produced Christianity. Now that approach skirted the whole issue of anti-Semitism, but it afforded the inspiration for much Christian theological speculation in subsequent generations. The great, perhaps greatest, Roman historian, Theodore Mommsen, he approached the matter from a very different direction. He was not concerned with the religious aspect of Judaism or any role that it might have played in the coming of Christianity. The more hard-nosed, pragmatic Mommsen focused upon the political aspects and any impact that they might have had upon the functioning of the Roman Empire. Mommsen's monumental history of Rome appeared in the 1850s and his provinces of the Roman Empire followed 30 years later in the period of heightened commitment to nationalism as the cornerstone of Germany's authority and power. And it's perhaps no coincidence that Mommsen saw Roman displeasure with the Jews as a consequence of their inability or their unwillingness to fit comfortably within the unifying mission of the Roman Empire. The Jews in Mommsen's depiction were supranational. The very spread of that people across ethnic and political boundaries undermined, or at least was perceived as undermining, the integrity of established divisions. Mommsen was less concerned about theology, one might say, than about theocracy. A needless concern, we might think, 
but maybe intelligible in the circumstances of late 19th century Germany. The Romans, Mommsen presumed, must have been troubled by the existence of a people centered upon their own exclusivity on the one hand and their international allegiances on the other, neither of which served the interests of the Roman order. As he put it, Jews are everywhere and nowhere at home, and everywhere and nowhere potent. He didn't see the Romans as anti-Semitic in any racial or ethnic or religious sense, but he reckoned the Jewish presence within the imperial state as a force for cosmopolitanism and thus for potential disintegration of the empire. This deeply troubled the Romans, according to Mommsen, and led ultimately to the war on Judea and to the destruction of the temple. Now, there's little, very little reason to believe that Mommsen's reconstruction stemmed from anti-Semitism on his own part, although it was understood in that sense by some of his readership. And Mommsen's towering influence may have helped to propagate that impression. Now, the question of whether Jews were perceived as constituting a religious or a political hazard to the established order plainly divided scholars of antiquity. The immensely learned historian Edvard Meyer, in his Geschichte des Altertums, which was composed at the end of the 19th century, Meyer encompassed both the classical and the Near Eastern worlds. And he supplied a separate study on uh, the Entstehung des Judentums. And with Meyer, the pendulum swung back to the religious explanation. He found the origins of anti-Semitism not in any racial animosity, not in any concern for the attenuation of the political structure, but in religious practices and beliefs that challenged pagan society in diaspora communities everywhere in the Mediterranean. So although Mommsen and Meyer differed on how to account for the roots of anti-Semitism, they shared a common approach, what one might call blame the victims. The Jews, whether through their peculiar customs, their separatist leanings, or their divergent religious beliefs, in this view, were ultimately responsible for the pagan backlash that issued in hostility. The tables were turned, however, when Jewish historians entered into the fray. A noteworthy example was the distinguished rabbi and classical scholar, Isaac Heinemann from Frankfurt, who came to maturity in the time of Meyer's imposing publications, but who migrated to Palestine for obvious reasons in the 1930s. Heinemann authored uh, the classic article on anti-Semitism, uh, on anti-Semitism in antiquity for the Pauli Vesova Real Encyclopedie der Klassischen Wissenschaft in 1931. For Heinemann, hostility to Jews began not with the Romans, but with the Greeks. Its roots were fixed in both the political and the religious spheres, not to mention the psychological sphere. The Hellenistic period, in his view, prompted hateful slanders and assaults from the Seleucid kingdom in Syria, exemplified, of course, by Antiochus IV's persecution, and from malicious Greco-Egyptian writers beginning in the Ptolemaic period and culminating in the pogrom in Alexandria in 38 CE. Jews did not bring it on themselves for Heinemann. They were tarred by their enemies with both denial of the gods and misanthropy toward humankind. It was a clash of Judaism and Hellenism that brought to the surface a deep-seated animosity toward the Jews. No, it's noteworthy that in the debates over whether ancient hostility toward Jews centered upon issues of custom, religion, 
or socio-political standing, none of the principal historians identified the roots as racial or ethnic. Now, of course, this changed in the period of National Socialism. But I'm not going to pause over that detestable era, which produced very few untainted works of serious scholarship, and certainly nothing of value on the Jews of antiquity. But the aftermath of the Holocaust in World War II produced a notable shift in the direction of scholarship. The question of how far early Christianity may have been responsible for the roots of anti-Semitism came to the fore. Debates were now rekindled, and that issue became volatile. In 1948, Marcel Simon of Strasbourg published his widely influential work, Verus Israel, which contended that Christian anti-Judaism anti can be traced primarily to competing proselytisms between the two faiths and the need that early Christians felt to establish their own identity as distinct from their Jewish roots. Now that line of argument moved to a new level with the work of the American Catholic theologian Rosemary Ruther. Her powerful book, Faith and Fratricide, the Theoretical Roots of Antisemitism, published in 1974, placed the onus of antisemitism squarely upon the early church. Pagan criticisms of the Jews, in her view, amounted to very little. They were mere irritation with peculiar customs and alien ways of life, but not an assault on the religion or any rejection of the race. That sort of thing came, in Ruther's view, with Christianity. The rift centered upon the Christological doctrines that alienated the Jews and issued both in persecution and in the ferociously hostile treatises of some church fathers. For Ruther, anti-Semitism is embedded in Christianity right from the start. Well, it need hardly be said that this perspective stirred considerable dissent and dispute the idea that Christian anti-Semitism prompted centuries of hatred that culminated in the Holocaust didn't sit well with most and generated a variety of responses that branded the Ruther thesis as oversimplified and monolithic. Responses to Ruther, whether direct or indirect, came from both theologians and historians, like Lloyd Gaston, Christa Stendhal, and E.P. Sanders who reinterpreted the writings of the New Testament and early Christianity, stripping them of much of the supposed hostility to Jews and rebutting the charge that anti-Semitism grew out of the messianism and Christology of the fledgling church. So the pendulum uh, consequently began to swing back once again. If Christianity, at least in its origins, could be largely absolved of the taint of anti-Semitism, it seemed productive then to re-examine pagan antiquity for the background of the animosity. The Swedish pastor, J.N. Svenster, devoted a substantial monograph to that subject in 1975. Svenster placed emphasis most emphatically upon pagan perceptions of Jewish strangeness. The peculiarity of Jewish customs the dietary laws, keeping the Sabbath, circumcision, the rejection of image worship, all this struck the Gentiles as quite alien, both contemptuous and contemptible. And above all, the Jews penchant for amixia, their reluctance to mingle with non-Jews, their tendency to misanthropy, drew pagan scorn and pagan antipathy in Sylvester's view. Now this took the Christians off the hook. But the thrust of Sylvester's thesis, even if unintentional, did present a case for blaming the victim. Jewish separateness, separateness and exclusivity, in his view, are themselves responsible for the negative image of the people in the eyes of their antagonists. 
<clears throat> now, the fine book by John Gager, The Origins of Antisemitism, published in 1985, conducts a valuable survey of opinions toward Jews by pagans, ancient Christians, and modern scholars. Gager takes an admirably even-handed approach, finding complex and divided attitudes towards Jews by Greek and Roman authors and authorities, and seeing a preponderance of sympathy rather than antipathy. And similarly, similar complexities existed for Gager with the early Christians. Among other things, he draws a distinction between popular Christianity and its intellectual leadership and shifting approaches between the Pauline letters and the church fathers. For Gager, internal debates were more prominent than either pagan or Christian disputes with Judaism. And there was no consistently negative understandings of the people or its religion and no thread that could lead to modern anti-Semitism. So now both pagans and Christians were off the hook. <laughs> the distinguished medieval historian, Gavin Langmuir, addressed this question in his sweeping study, History, Religion, and Antisemitism of 1990. Langmuir acknowledged that hostility to Jews emerged at the pivotal time when early Christians needed to distinguish their faith from Jewish beliefs. It was an issue of identity for the fledgling sect. They stressed the failure of Jews to understand that, Jew that Jesus was a fulfillment of their scriptures, and in some cases denounced them as deicides. But for Langmuir, <coughs> this constituted what he called anti-Judaism did not sink to the level of anti-Semitism with its fantasies of Jewish evildoers indulging in ritual murders. This did not happen until the coming of the Middle Ages. So antiquity was now absolved of blame. But the debates over pagan attitudes persisted. The Israeli scholar Tzvi Yavetz published an important article on what he termed Judeophobia in 1993, followed by a set of lectures delivered in Munich in 1997, entitled Judenfeindschaft in der Antike. <clears throat> and almost simultaneously, the eminent Peter Schaefer, who held chairs in both Berlin and Princeton, produced his influential work, also entitled Judeophobia. Now, Schaefer cited hateful comments among Greco-Egyptian writers, as well as uprisings against Jews in Elephantine and Alexandria. And he proceeded to register hostile remarks by Roman intellectuals about Jewish practices and the extensive number of converts to Judaism, thereby to argue that pagans felt a deep threat from Jewish superstition a threat to their cherished values and ways of life. Now, Yavetz <coughs> raised a somewhat different but equally problematic issue when he asked, was Gentile anxiety about the Jews a unique phenomenon, or were Jews simply categorized with aliens generally? Just another example of barbarians whose customs, behavior, and beliefs Greeks and Romans found abhorrent. What was, or was there anything special about Jews? Yavetz acknowledged that Jews from a pagan point of view were in most respects just as barbarian as any other alien people. But in some respects, they were a little more so, which is an intriguing proposition, but very hard to pin down in particulars. What may have made Jews special barbarians in the eyes of the pagans, if they were so, remained a mystery even after Yavetz's contribution. And indeed, one might well <coughs> question whether they were really perceived as special. In my view, the concept of Judeophobia, fear of the Jews, does not represent a marked advance. Now, a book of the highest importance appeared in the following decade, 
My colleague and friend, Benjamin Isaac, published his imposing study, The Origins of Racism in Classical Antiquity, in 2004. That work covered a vast terrain, encompassing ethnicities across the Mediterranean and beyond, to Gaul, Germany, Iran. Isaac produced scores of examples to illustrate ancient prejudices, irrational hatreds, tawdry bias, but he set racism in a different category. Um, racism, an attitude that branded nations and peoples with characteristics determined by heredity or by geography, Isaac finds very little of that in antiquity. But he sees enough to interpret ancient prejudices as a form of precursor to modern racism, what he called proto-racism. But it's noteworthy that Isaac sharply distinguished such hostility toward Jews from later anti-Semitism and sets it outside the category of racism or even proto-racism. The litany of ancient complaints about Jews, their bizarre customs, their separatism, their anti-socialism, their weird religious beliefs, even for Isaac, their proselytism. This may have prompted some Judeophobia, but did not amount to racist animosity. That was reserved to those whose failings failing, were biologically determined. And that is an important distinction. And Isaac declines to trace modern anti-Semitism back to the bigotries of antiquity. So where do we stand now, since I'm told I only have a few minutes left? Well, one might have hoped to find the answer in David Nirenberg's recent and much acclaimed book, Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition, published in 2013, tracing the concept from antiquity to the Holocaust. In this deeply researched book, buttressed by more than 100 pages of footnotes, can only command uh, admiration, but, Nirenberg expressly disavows the idea that he presents the history of anti-Semitism. His anti-Judaism is not something that be eventually becomes transformed into anti-Semitism as it does with Langmuir. For Nirenberg, anti-Judaism persists throughout, but it's not really about Jews at all, rather about conceptual notions of Jews, constructs and concoctions with very little regard for Jewish reality the very point that Sartre made 70 years ago. Indeed, for Nirenberg, it is applicable to other peoples and nations as well. <clears throat> now, whether his book has succeeded in moving the long-standing debates about ancient animosities towards Jews <clears throat> is questionable. Because this chapter on pagan perspectives limits itself strictly to problems that arose in Egypt. And I'm not sure that this general thesis about the eye of the beholder illustrated with only a very few examples that this really resolves debates about the stimulus for and the character of ancient animosity towards Jews. The debates will no doubt continue. Now my very brief and of course highly selective survey of some of the major contributions to the discussion over the past century and a half, I've tried to identify certain issues, some areas of agreement, even agreement to disagree, but one very important consensus, I think, does emerge. That whatever the origins and the course of anti-Jewish feelings among pagans and early Christians, they did not possess a racial or ethnic character. However nasty the comments that Greek or Roman writers made about Jewish customs, rituals, and behavior, they avoided branding them as determined by heredity, genealogy, or blood. And early Christian conflicts with Jews, of course, centered upon religious competition and internecine differences that had nothing to do with race. I believe that some red herrings, some familiar red herrings, have been cleared away in recent decades. Very few now believe, as Mommsen and others did in the 19th century, that Jews were widely regarded as merchants, bankers, and moneylenders, a stereotype that did not surface at all in antiquity. The notion that Jews were attacked because they were perceived as fundamentally undermining pagan religion with their monotheism or with some other subversive principles 
that view no longer carries much weight. Nor does the once influential proposition that Jewish internationalism and cosmopolitanism represented or was imagined to represent a menace to the unity of imperial power. The notion of Judeophobia among pagan critics has received some traction in recent years, as I mentioned, but that there was any significant fear of Jewish growth in numbers or of vigorous missionary efforts, this is alluded to in only a very few sources, scattered comments, and it's hard to take seriously as a basic uh, source of anxiety or animosity among the pagans. The uprisings that resulted in assaults or even wars on Jews like the Alexandrian pogrom in 38 or the Roman war on Judea were highly unusual events triggered by special circumstances, hardly reflective of general attitudes toward Jews who were almost everywhere and at almost all times in antiquity left alone. But insofar as there was hostility, did the Jews bring it on themselves, an idea that raised by Voltaire and could readily be inferred from the otherwise very different works of Mommsen and Maya, Jewish exclusiveness interpreted as xenophobia and misanthropy and Jewish monotheism as a challenge to the established uh, religious consciousness, these were seen as generating pagan backlash. But the idea that Jewish behavior, particularly their self-segregation, was responsible for pagan resentment that view has had a long life, but it holds very little sway now. Even those modern scholars who acknowledge that Jewish exclusiveness and the peculiarity of Jewish practices may have prompted some scorn and derision by pagan authors, they do not see them as, precipitate, as a precipitating cause of hostility. In short, there's a broad accord that exists on various matters that previously brought only discord, resistance, to the idea that anti-Semitism in anything like the form it took in the medieval and modern periods, resistance to that idea in antiquity now seems uniform. The substitution of the term anti-Judaism is not much help, for that, sim that uh, seems to imply revulsion for the religion or the ideology of the Jews, for which there is very little evidence among the pagans and scant support among the early Christians. So it may be time, certainly time for me to finish, it may also be time to reconsider the proposition that anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, Judeophobia, or whatever label one wishes to apply, that it had much purchase in antiquity. The dramatic episodes that are regularly cited, the persecutions by Antiochus IV, the riots in Alexandria, and the Roman assault on Judea, should perhaps best be seen as rare and exceptional events provoked by unusual circumstances or perpetrators rather than as representative of the Jewish experience in the long centuries of dwelling in the Greco-Roman world. Thank you very much.